Hello, everybody. Happy Thursday afternoon. Hope yours is going well. And today we have another Seahawks video to get to. But before we get to the football content, let's take a look at our latest subscriber milestone. As of today, we have surpassed 1,260 subscribers to the channel. That is up nearly 20 from where it was at this time yesterday. We gained a lot of subscribers during the stream last night. We gained a lot of subscribers from the Wagner video yesterday. So things are going great. Things are looking up. We are now past 1,260. Let's try to get to 1,300 by the end of the game on Sunday. Let's go for 1,600 by the end of the year. At this rate, we'll easily do that. So... Once again, I want to say thank you to all my subscribers, old and new. If you guys were not watching my videos, I would not be making them. All right. So, today we are going to go to the road to 150, although I'm going to go ahead and say something here. It's about to turn into a road to 200, because if you take a look at the way teams are playing against the Seahawks, 150 is not going to cut it anymore, but more on that a little later. So... I have here the updated pressure stats as of this week. As of the end of the Cowboys game, how are the Seahawks defensive players doing in terms of rushing the opposing quarterback? We've got some good stuff to report and some not so good stuff to report. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. First, we're going to start with the bad. Uh, Rasheem Green did not play on Sunday, so his count stays at one, and he's not going to play for another two weeks at least. It seems like he's going to be back after the bye week, but even there, I'm not holding my breath. But very unfortunate news here. His opportunity to have a big contribution in 2020 is rapidly slipping away. All right, now we get to some good news, though. Benson Mayoa had a monster game against the Cowboys that I did not notice until I went back and looked at the numbers. He generated four pressures on Dak Prescott, including what should have been the game-ending sack. I don't know how he blew it, but... It happens, and after three games, Mayoa's pressure rate is up to seven, or excuse me, number of pressures is up to seven. So he is well on pace to pass the 24 I expected. Now, he's playing way more snaps than I expected, and he's getting way more pass rush opportunities than I expected, but regardless, he is performing at a very high level, and I don't have very much bad to say about a defensive end who can get seven pressures in three games. So Mayoa is kicking butt so far. Speaking of kicking butt, we have LJ Collier next on the list. He generated one pressure against the Cowboys. He had other good plays as well, by the way. I want to I want to be clear on that. He played well against the Cowboys, even if he only had one pressure. But the bigger point is this. He is now one pressure away from meeting my 2020 expectations. And with a game against Miami this weekend, you got to like his chances to meet his expectations for the whole year by the quarter mark. So very good stuff from LJ Collier. Also very good stuff from Alton Robinson, who I did not expect a ton from this year. I was very conservative with my estimate of saying, oh, I think he'll get four pressures. I don't think he's going to play much. When he does play, I'm sure he's not going to do that much. We're looking at maybe 10 to 15 snaps a game. Well, against the Cowboys, he didn't play that much, but he did generate two QB pressures, including a sack that came on the second-to-last meaningful play of the game. So Alton Robinson put in some work against the Cowboys. I thought he played great. I think he looks like somebody who might be able to be a much bigger part of this pass rush than I thought. And the last bit of good news, and this is a little thin here, but Demontre Moore... He did have two bad penalties against the Cowboys that hurt us, but he did generate a pressure against the Cowboys as well, which means he has now generated one pressure in every game the Seahawks have played in, so he's up to three after three games. He's on pace to crush my expectations, but again, he does need to play a little bit better, I think. He does need to clean things up a little bit, but still... He is finding his own way to contribute. All right, we're going to blow through these next ones real quick. DeAndre Walker is gonzo bonzo. I think he played one snap against the Cowboys. Not on the team anymore. Maybe he'll make it down to the practice squad. Maybe he won't. But my meager expectations for him in 2020 will not be met. Clearly, Jerron Reed. All right. <clears throat> He's off the trouble list after a good game against the Cowboys where he had Two pressures, including one sack that was also a forced fumble. 
So Jerron Reed played a good game against the Cowboys. He's still not really on pace to meet my expectations, but if he plays like he played against the Cowboys going forward, I think we're going to have something. So he's got three pressures after three games. We need to see more, but he's headed in the right direction at least. Okay, next up we have Puna Ford, who is playing well, mind you. Still does not have a QB pressure. Um, I, I want to see a little something from him in the near future, or, or I'm going to be a little concerned. Puna Ford, I understand, is a one-dimensional limited player, but we need to see a little more from Puna. I'm a little concerned, but not really concerned about this. Brian Monet, also playing well, technically does not have a pressure yet, but he is earning his keep on this team so far through his run defense and just generally giving quality snaps. The pressure, I think, will come with the way he's playing, but Monet, as of right now, has nothing. Daryl Taylor has not played. He has nothing. Shaquem Griffin, we have a new name on the list, guys, replacing DeAndre Walker, more or less. You can kind of wipe Walker out and put Shaquem in. <clears throat> I think the way we use him and the way he's playing and the way teams are playing against us and the way this team is scoring, Shaquem Griffin's going to have a pretty significant impact on this team. I, off the top of my head, I said eight total pressures in 2020. I think he's going to be playing maybe 15, 20 snaps a game, and I think he's going to be rushing on most of them, so I said eight. He had one against the Cowboys. He made other good plays against the Cowboys, too, by the way. He played well against the Cowboys, even outside of just his pass rush. So, yeah, I think Shaquem could get up to eight this year. He's well on pace to meet that, if you consider the fact that he's only played in one game. And finally, Anthony Rush had to put him here because now he's part of the rotation. Uh, I, I roughly said I expect him to get one pressure. I don't think he's that kind of player, and I don't think he plays that way. So, so far, he has none. I'm sure he'll pick up a random pressure at some point this season just because that's the way things happen. But, uh, yeah, not nothing from him yet. Okay, that's the defensive line. So through three games, players on the Seahawks' defensive line have generated a total of 23 pressures, which sounds good until you remember that teams have dropped back to pass against the Seahawks about 170 times probably. So this we got to pump this number up. This is a rookie number right here. we got to pump these numbers up. Okay, linebackers now. So Bobby Wagner is still the only currently active linebacker with a QB pressure. Um, three after three games. So he's on pace to crush my expectations. He's doing fine here. And granted, my expectations should probably be a little higher in light of the fact that this team is playing differently than I thought they would. But um, he, he's going to have a good season if this keeps up in terms of getting at the QB. Uh, K.J. Wright still has nothing, which is not unexpected. Uh, Bruce Irvin still out for the year. Jordan Brooks blitzed a bunch against the Cowboys and did not actually generate an official pressure on any plays, which is disappointing. I saw good things from Jordan Brooks when I watched the tape, but the pressure did not come yet, and now he's out for a couple weeks. So we'll see. I think he showed some potential to get a few pressures this year, but we're not going to know for maybe a month. All right, Cody Barton did nothing, and Ben Burkirvan doesn't even play on defense, so he got nothing. Uh, cornerback. This is going to be quick. Uh, none of our cornerbacks have generated pressure yet. We are blitzing them a little more than I expected, so these numbers, at least some of them, should go up a little bit. Like Ugo Amadi in particular should have a few pressures this year, but uh, through three games, nothing from the cornerbacks. Now we go to the safeties, and there is one clear star of the show here. Jamal Adams got another pressure against the Cowboys to move to seven. Tied for team lead and one of the best totals of probably the highest total of any safety in the NFL right now. So seven pressures for Jamal Adams through three games and nothing for any of the other safeties. Blair is still out. Delano Hill is actually blitzing a little bit, so he may pick up a couple at some point. Um, Diggs, I think, blitzed maybe once against the Cowboys. So if you add it all up, you've got 37 pressures through three games. And if you do the math, that actually means the Seahawks are on pace to have close over 190 pressures. And that's good. 190 pressures is more pressures than the Steelers had last year when they led the league in sacks. Here's the problem, though, guys. Other teams are on pace to throw the ball about 55 to 60 times a game against this team. So 12 pressures a game is not cutting it. So clearly 
the way this team is playing and the way teams are playing against the Seahawks team is forcing us all to reevaluate our needs and expectations. I will say that the pass rush through three games overall has been okay. I, I don't think you can look at these numbers and say anybody is doing or any group is doing terribly or that any position group is underperforming to the point where we need to go desperately get somebody else or we need to um, trade for somebody. I'm not seeing that, but I do think that we need to raise our expectations for this pass rush and say, hey, we need to be generating pressure on maybe 30% of opponent dropbacks. Right now we're doing it at 20. So I didn't see this coming. I didn't think teams were going to pass the ball this much against us, but the run defense is playing well, and we're constantly scoring points, so teams are kind of forced to do what they need to do. It's definitely changing the formula. So what do you guys think of the pass rush so far? I think it was pretty good against the Cowboys, but they were playing a makeshift offensive line. Overall this year, I think it's been okay, but it needs to get better because eventually we're going to we're going to be needing to generate pressure at a higher clip than like 20% of the dropbacks. The actual number might be a little lower, by the way, but it's going to be around 20%. That seems not good enough for me. And more than that, some of these pressures need to turn into sacks. Benson Mayoa was the latest victim of blowing an easy sack against the Cowboys, but we saw him do it against the Patriots. We saw Jamal Adams do it against the Patriots. Uh, I think maybe Bruce Irvin did it against the Patriots. We're not getting home when the opportunity is there and that needs to change. But that's the road to 150, more like road to 250 if teams keep playing this way against us. But as you can see, there's some good stuff and some bad stuff. What are you taking away from all this stuff today? All right, peace out, go Hawks. There will be a stream tonight as always, and there will be more videos coming tomorrow. Peace.